switching gears back to uh, H171, um, we are um, focused this afternoon, I think on some level on that part of the bill that relates to um, uh, scholarships and training and education. And um, so we have um, uh, Sonia Raymond and um, Johnny Flood um, who are gonna talk to us and uh, I want to ask both of you, um, should we stop and uh, do you want us to stop you while you're in the middle while you are speaking or would you like us, would you for us to wait um, till after both of you speak or uh, if you'd like after Sonia you speak and then Johnny you speak? What's your preference? Um, probably after I speak and after he speaks, we, I mean, after each speaks, if you have questions to ask of that person, that makes sense, I think. Thank, that works thank for you, you Johnny. It, it helps us to know whether we can interrupt you or whether yeah. we should hold our questions because usually, um, oftentimes, if we hold our questions, they get answered. Um, okay, um, thank you. Thank you again, Sonia, for uh, um, coming this afternoon. You're very welcome. Well, I'd be speaking um, first. Just in committee, if you're <laughs> following it, it's, it's section uh, nine and 10 of the bill. Sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Um, thank you for inviting me to testify this afternoon. Uh, my name is Sonia Raymond. I'm the executive director for the Vermont Association for the Education of Young Children. Um, so Quality early childhood education has always been essential to our economy, but in these very stressful times that we've all been facing, access to early childhood education has actually become imperative, providing the stability for families that they serve, ensuring healthy growth and development of our children. And when the pandemic hit, many people began to work from home, as you know, but there was a portion of our population, our essential workers, for whom that wasn't possible. And it was the early childhood education programs that stepped up and reopened their businesses to serve these families. And it was all of you in the Vermont legislature that actually led the nation in supporting these programs until the state reopened as no other state did. Um, it has never been more clear that an investment in early education is not just the key to Vermont's economic health, but provides the very foundation for young children to develop into well-rounded, happy, productive members of our society. Even before the pandemic, the very existence of early education was in jeopardy, and that hasn't changed. Families cannot afford early education with um, some paying as much as 30% of their household income, even with state assistance, and early educators can't make a living with a medium average wage at 13.72 per hour, often without access to health insurance. Program capacities continue to decrease and challenges with hiring and retaining early educators have reached a crisis point. Without specific and targeted investments being fully realized, we will continue this decline. The quality of early an early education program begins and ends with qualified early education program staff and leadership. Unless we assure that there are affordable entry points into the profession and resources for those currently in the workforce and proper compensation for the important work early educators do, we will not stop the exodus of early educators out of the field and we will never attract new early educators to the field. Addressing affordability for families must be a top priority as well. We cannot hope to have a strong economy if families cannot go to work, yet this is a reality that our state is facing. Most families now face a difficult choice. Do I wanna support my family when the majority of my paycheck is paying for early education or will I stay home and begin accessing other social supports for my family. H171 calls for several key actions and investments that are the first steps necessary to addressing affordability and accessibility to quality early education for working families. Changes to our, China, our child care financial assistance program over time that move us from reimbursements to programs being based in the market rate to the true cost of care 
to a structure where families pay no more than 10% of their household income is imperative. These changes when fully implemented will mean that the 70% of working families will be able that are accessing early care and education will be able to afford the desperately needed services and programs. And it will also allow programs to compensate early educators with wages that are commensurate with peers in other fields. This is addressing quality is really a three prong approach to providing the supports and resources to build a pipeline into early education and to retaining those currently in the workforce. All three prongs are crucial to building the much needed capacity in early education programs. The first that you see in H171 is the funding for scholarships for the current workforce to create a true pathway for those who have little to no education all the way through those who are working to attain their teacher license. While we have scholarships that support early educators in attaining their apprenticeship certificate, associate's degree, and teacher licensure endorsement, we need additional funding to sustain the current 95 recipients. And additionally, we're missing the crucial step of having a scholarship that supports those that need to move from an associate's to a bachelor's. There are currently 40 early educators on our wait list for this scholarship. We've been seeking, we are seeking funding to support 25 BA scholarships this year. And the governor's budget allocates 150 for this purpose, but we need an additional 300 to support our current 95 and additional 25 BA. Creating a loan repayment is the second prong for those newer early educators working in private community programs with a degree. This is an important vehicle to retaining this quality early educators. It is this population that cannot afford their basic living expenses, car, rent, food, and their monthly student loan. And unfortunately are often choosing to leave the programs that they work in to find a position that pays them a livable wage. The loan repayment program outlined in H171 would allow these early educators to remain in community-based programs. Schol the third is the scholarship funds that will be available for our higher education institutions to assist students who wish to attain early education degree and are attending minimally part-time. This option makes it affordable for students at our state colleges and universities to obtain early childhood or early childhood special ed degrees to build that pipeline of our future early educators. We're in a crucial moment in time. We know that early education is essential to our economy and the health, the growth and development of our young children. We have seen the fragility of this industry, especially over the last year. If we do not address affordability, accessibility and the quality, we will and target and make intentional investments in the early education system now, we will lose this industry as we've watched happen in many other states. That would truly be a cost that we can't afford. Are there any questions? Sonia, um, thank you. you um, have really sort of set the stage very thoughtfully. Um, a question that I have, um, given your um, history in this, um, is there any data that you are collecting as it relates to how many of your of the graduates or how many of the um, recipients of scholarships actually go into early care and education? And how long do they are they, and how long do they stay? So yes, we do um, have data. So at first, it's important to understand that the current scholarships that we have available in this um, state right now are targeted specifically to the current workforce, meaning those that are working minimally thirty hours a week in an right. early childhood program. 
we don't have loan repayment and we don't have scholarships for colleges to give to students that come in, say out of high school or off of another career path and into early education. Those don't exist. So the data we have is specifically um, for the scholarships that we give out for those in the incumbent workforce. And part of that scholarship program actually is a commitment to remaining minimally in the program they are working in for an additional year after their scholarship completes. Um, not only do we keep, you know, do folks hold to that commitment, but we then keep data. And I haven't looked at it this year, meaning since um, the fall, um, because we just entered into a new semester. But as of the last semester ending in the data, we have 82% of our previous scholars that have remained in the field since this program began in 2015. Thank you, that's, that's good information. Uh, any uh, committee, do you have uh, any other questions? Okay, Johnny. Hi everybody, uh, thank you for inviting me here today. So. Uh, my name is Johnny Flood. I wear a lot of different hats in this field. Um, so I just want to introduce myself a little bit and tell you what hats I'll be wearing today as I speak to you. Um, so I am an educator. I've worked with middle, I've been a middle school teacher, high school teacher. I've worked with incarcerated youths. I was a, a classroom preschool teacher for years. Um, I currently work at Vermont Humanities as their literacy programs manager. So that part of my responsibilities are overseeing our professional development um, opportunities for early educators. Um, and I'm also on the board of directors at a local child care center. Um, but today um, I'm really speaking as um, an educator and as a member of the Early Childhood Educators Coalition, which is a worker led statewide advocacy group that formed out of the frustration around the reopening plan of last spring. And I think I'd actually like to start there. Um, on May 22nd of last year, Ted Brady, our Deputy Secretary of Commerce and Community Development, he, he told the Senate Health and Wellness Committee that childcare was one of the biggest obstacles to reopening the economy, um, on par only with a lack of available testing and PPE. He told the committee that employers were telling him that childcare was in fact the single biggest obstacle to getting employees back to work. So for me, another way to say this is that childcare providers are one of our most essential professions. They're vital to the proper functioning of Vermont's economy. And yet um, these essential indispensable workers who we have all leaned on, not just since June of last year, but for years and years before that, their, their wages and working conditions do not nearly reflect the magnitude and the value of their role. Um, Sonia mentioned this, but according to the Building Bright Futures Early Childhood Systems Needs Assessment, the median wage for a preschool teacher in the state is $14.57 an hour, and for other childcare workers, it's only $12.71. Um, we can compare that to the kindergarten teachers who we send our four and five-year-olds to at the end of every summer, who make 31.69 an hour, a wage that does in fact reflect their skills and the value of their role in our communities. Um, and while we still ask to raise all minimum wages to at least $15 an hour, it's important to know in Vermont that according to a report from the National Low Income Housing Coalition, our state's housing wage, the hourly wage our neighbors must earn to afford a two bedroom home at fair market rent is 22.78 an hour. And in Burlington, it's almost 30 an hour. So the majority of early educators are, are really condemned, living paycheck to paycheck, struggling to afford housing, food, and health care. And I think it's also worth mentioning that this is a field primarily staffed by women whose skills, dedication, and labor go largely unnoticed and underappreciated. They earn subpar wages and they're largely subsidizing childcare costs themselves. Uh, this is true of home providers um, in our coalition who will go without paying themselves for a week or two when they know some of their families are unable to come up with the cost of tuition. And this is true on the other side of mothers who have had to pull themselves out of the workforce 
to watch their children. In my preschool classroom pre-pandemic, I had 18 three to five year olds in my care every day, which meant constant care, attention, clarity, precision, planning, and a lot of reaction. Uh, 18 kiddos is it's a lot of noses to be wiped, wet pants to be changed, and more often than you'd expect, things like fights to stop and crying children to comfort. And that's all without mentioning the activities to set up, curricula to design, and direct classroom instruction to put into practice. In the meantime, uh, in my classroom, I had to meet the Act 166 requirements of documentation and assessment, which meant recording at least three pieces of evidence for 73 different benchmarks for all 25 of my kiddos. That's, that's almost 5,500 pieces of evidence to record, write up, and grade for each grading period. I had no time to meet with my co-teacher for planning. I had very little time to meet with parents. And after working 8.30 to 5.30, with that kind of energy output and focus, getting home, the, the thought of attending night classes just to eventually reach what's considered a livable or fair housing wage, uh, frankly, was demoralizing. It was depressing and it was devaluing. And uh, honestly, it still feels easier for me to come tell all of you that the people doing this work just need more money. Um, and all that was before the pandemic. Once the pandemic hit, um, this essential, vital, dedicated, stretched thin workforce was asked to return to in-person instruction without hazard pay or state provided PPE in order to save and prop up Vermont's economy for all of us. Um, I should note here that our organization, the ECEC partnered with Sonia at, and last summer and VACI or the Vermont Association for the Education of Young Children. Last summer, we partnered to run a healthcare survey of child childcare providers in Vermont. And unfortunately, the results matched what we had known and said to each other for a long time. Results from this survey showed that over 11% of childcare workers in Vermont are uninsured completely and over 50% are underinsured. And for those who do have some type of insurance, the majority were insured through a spouse or a family member, which is never a sustainable or adequate solution. We know people can feel trapped in a job by the healthcare it provides, but people can also feel trapped in households or relationships for the same reason. Um, and when our coalition asked Dr. Levine if he would advise someone do our job without health insurance, he immediately said no. But again, compared to statewide and national statistics, childcare workers in Vermont are both uninsured and underinsured at a much higher rate than the general population. Only 3% of Vermonters as a whole are uninsured compared to 11% of childcare workers. And 36% under the age of 65 in Vermont are underinsured compared to over 50. Um, I personally used to take extra unpaid time off from my classroom teaching in order to keep my income under the threshold to qualify for Medicaid because I did not have the extra income to pay for my own insurance and I had to be very careful about what that looked like. Um, and it should be noted that with all this going on, many childcare workers are working side gigs for money, you know, under the table in order to supplement their insufficient income and they aren't reporting it for the same reasons. Uh, so yeah, I was paying 50% of my income on housing in what could generously be described as an efficient one bedroom apartment. Um, and that's not counting utilities, car payments, groceries, student loads, and uh, any unexpected expenses. I would also take freelance transcription jobs at night to supplement my income. And with my education and experience in the field, I was actually making more money than many of my colleagues. So, so when we were forced back to work, without adequate protections. Um, I, I knew I had to have a conversation with my family because of the conditions I was gonna be working in. Um, and many of you here actually know my family. Um, my father, Patrick Flood, he's gonna be 70 this year. He's pretty solidly in the at-risk category. Um, and just incidentally in his retirement, he and my mother have actually been providing childcare for my niece so that my sister doesn't have to quit her job to raise her daughter. And knowing that in my work as a preschool teacher, I was gonna be in very close contact with those small children and their noses and wet pants and tears and all the secretions that come with that trade, um, my family told me they would not be comfortable seeing me in person for the duration of the pandemic. So 
like Sonia said, I left the profession. Um, and I now work for Vermont Humanities. And it's a good job with a wonderful organization that does a lot of good in our state. Um, it is not, however, essential to Vermont's economy. I don't think anyone at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development would force my current colleagues and I back to in-person working conditions to preserve the stability of our economy. And yet, now as a non-essential worker, I now make nearly twice as much money as I did as a preschool teacher. I have very good health insurance and I can work from the safety of my own home. I can see my parents, my siblings, my niece, while my former colleagues in childcare, however, are still working under the same looming viral threat, the same uninsured numbers, and the same wages as before. And it should be said, like our colleagues in elementary and secondary ed, they're not in line to be vaccinated as a group. And, you know, do these people not deserve a living wage, deserve access to adequate housing, health care? Should our essential and dedicated and skilled professionals in this field be tasked with propping up our state's economy for all of us with, you know, essentially nothing more than a well-intentioned thank you? So today, I, I'm here to ask the committee, I'm here to ask all of you to look directly at the issue actually before, um, on page eight of this bill, where it's stated that early childhood educator compensation will be commensurate with peers in other fields. And I would say their peers are educators. Their peers are the kindergarten teachers who make 31 an hour. Childcare providers are vitally important educators who provide stimulating and nurturing environments for their students at perhaps their most critical developmental stage. And they deserve to be compensated for their valuable labor and skills. So we, um, the Early Childhood Educators Coalition, we really encourage the committee to be specific in, in your calls for adequate compensation and that entry level wage for child care providers be raised to 25 an hour and that all child care providers receive comprehensive health care. Uh, student loan repayment and scholarship opportunities, while a, a, a valuable part of a good compensation package, those alone are not nearly sufficient to meet the need. You know, child care is a collective good it, for state officials, for businesses, for employers, for parents, for grandparents, for teachers, for children, for all of us. We need a child care system that represents our values. And we need creative, courageous leadership to get us there. And we can get there. Um, the ECEC, we've been talking with similar coalitions around the country and Multnomah County in Oregon, which has a population of around 800,000, it's only a bit bigger than our state. They just successfully passed an ordinance that all four and five-year-olds in the county would receive full day, five days a week childcare using their existing mix of public, private, and home-based care. They did this while also dramatically raising wages for all childcare providers to be equivalent to kindergarten teachers and all just by taxing the top 12% of earners in the county and no one below that threshold. So we can do this and um, we owe it to our essential workers now more than ever. Thank you. I think you're still muted. Thank you. You'd think after a year, I would learn how to do this. Um, Representative Redmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering if we can send uh, the witness to Washington to advocate on a federal level because you are amazingly, you laid it out so beautifully. So thank you. I'd be happy to go, although I guess these days I wouldn't have to go to Washington. I just stay here, and get a different Zoom link. Um, Johnny, so what, uh, let me, um, if you were to, um, how, how would you want, how would you suggest to us that we modify the bill? I think, uh, as I said, being specific about what a, a commensurate compensation package um, means, as it, as it stands, um, it's carefully worded. And I understand that, but I think looking carefully at what wages should be, deserve to be for these folks, need to be, um, and also providing healthcare. 
So I, we're recommending 25 an hour. That's um, below the median wage for kindergarten teachers. And it is above fair market rent wages in our state. Um, and that child care workers have access to comprehensive health care. Thank you, that's helpful. We're getting to the point where we have to do wordsmithing and agreeing and that kind of thing. So that's helpful. Um, are there any uh, additional questions? Representative Brumstead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johnny. I, um, wow. That was amazing. <laughs> and um, all that is going on in the system, we all sort of hear little pieces in our own communities, but to have it put all together in one presentation, really very moving. I'm curious, I mean, we want to do this. We, we've all been working on this for a lot of years. And, but it, one of the things that's a struggle and is hard is that part of the system is private and some of it's public and it's all sort of, if it was all public and everybody was a state employee, they would get the state employees benefits and that would be, you know, sure it would cost more, but it would be succinct and a little bit easier to put your head, you know, sort of wrap your mind around it. Um, I'm just curious, you've worked, it sounds like in private centers and, um, have you thought about that at all? I'm not really sure what my question is, but I, I wanted to just put out there so you understand sort of what we're struggling with a little bit here. Yeah, I'll say that as a coalition, we're talking about that, um, but we don't have any hard and fast agreements, but I will, uh, I'll say that, you know, there are a lot of home-based providers who if we continue, continue, continue to professionalize and raise what it takes to be a childcare provider in this state educationally, those people are gonna get locked out of the system. And that's gonna reduce access dramatically and immediately. And these folks are just as essential, their labor has just as much dignity as folks with a bachelor's or more. So, um, you know, I like the, we were speaking with those organizers in Portland and in Oregon who, who, who got that ballot measure passed because they have a similar mix you know they had they it's it's there's a lot of ways to provide child care and they um they they were able to incorporate all of those and still increase access make it a made it, make it completely affordable for families and raise wages so their system doesn't necessarily need to bring it all under the umbrella of the aoe for example thank you thank you sonia I just wanted to speak to your question, Representative Brumstead. Um, so the concept of compensation and, um, you know, paying a livable wage and having the benefits that are they are due, really um, what that entails, having access to those benefits specifically in compensation mean that programs, including home-based programs, are able to actually charge the cost of care. <laughs> right now, as Johnny pointed out, it is on the backs of every one of the early educators in this industry. I mean, that's it. That's, that's the simple, plain truth of it. And, you know, parents cannot be paying any more than they're paying. They, you're basically... Uh, as I pointed out, people are up against a wall, these families, they can't pay what, what it costs. It continued, the costs continue to go up every year. And that's with us paying $13.72 on average per. So we need to figure out how we fund the cost. And you know, the Blue Ribbon Commission did their work, the think tank did their work. The figures are out there, we know what the cost is. Um, this bill asks for us to really take a fresh look at that and decide how to move forward to create a fund um, to look at those private public um, philanthropic mixtures and figure it out. It's going to take a significant investment. There is no question. There's no getting around the millions of dollars this costs. I think the cost to not doing it is going to become far greater to this economy if we don't. 
if programs were able to charge what they needed to, they would be offering benefits. Look at the YMCA, for instance, right? Look at some of these larger um, programs or affiliations, they're offering them, right? Some private programs are offering them. That's because they're able to charge what is necessary to actually have a group plan. That would be one way you could assure it. You could start a state plan which can be accessed, if you wish, <laughs> by our um, early educators. That would be another way. But the bottom line is it's an investment in the cost, um, just as it is with compensation. Thank you, Sonia. Um, we have a question from uh, Representative Whitman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you so much, uh, Sonia and Johnny for um, your great testimony. Um, I wanted to talk more about the cost of care and um, especially um, like you mentioned that we've uh, found out ways to calculate that. I saw that a couple days ago, we got the fair market survey released and it included a piece for the difference between what that market rate is and what that cost of care is. And we see that we're not keeping up. Um, my question is um, adding the component of increasing wages, um, say to 25 an hour entry. Um, would that be, is that included in some of the studies that you mentioned as well, Sonia, as far as um, not only what the difference in funding would be to start compensating providers at cost of care, but also that increased wage. And the reason that I ask that is because in the short term, um, from some of our uh, conversations with Commissioner Brown, there's uh, thoughts of what belongs in the study component of this bill. And um, there's, uh, it kind of comes down to what do we address now and what do we address in uh, January, 2023. Um, so I, I'm interested in kind of what we know right now as far as switching the cost of care. Yes, that was a consideration in these studies. Um, I would say that um, as we're asking that, you know, what be looked at when you're doing this study is pay as was pointed out that's commensurate to others in a similar field or um, with similar, similar credentials and um, similar work that they are doing. Um, when you take a look at that, um, you know, you're gonna see the clear differences that exist. And I, I would also say that, you know, this state has undergone um, the exploration of becoming a profession, um, early education becoming a, a recognized profession, I guess is the way to put it. Um, and in that, um, you know, we are, uh, there are several current studies um, going on, one um, which CDD is currently doing on wage and fringe and benefits um, in the field in, in Vermont. And I would use that study that will be complete this spring, um, you know, and the work that's going on within the efforts around advancing as a profession really are taking a look at, you know, um, what are the skills and experience that folks hold and what is an appropriate compensation? Um, in fact, the whole premise is do not require anything more without compensation, right? Like, so we are where we are and you cannot require anything more without fair compensation because the reality is that doesn't exist, but we actually do have the resources we need to really dig into this and look and make some clear paths forward. There are the studies that have been done and the current ones that are being done to reference. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, and your hand is up. Do you have another question? <laughs> no, um, no th uh, thank you. Thank you all for the questions.
questions. Are there any last questions that folks have for Sonia or Johnny? Or Sonia or Johnny, do you have anything you want to leave us with? I would just say go bold. I know it's a tough time, but honestly, we won't make a dent. And I am just deathly afraid that we are headed down a path we can't come back from. Um, I've watched it sliding over the last five to 10 years significantly, and it really concerns me, um, especially as the industry is such an important piece of our economy at this point. Um, we just have to find a way and get creative and make incremental steps. I'll second that, go bold. It's desperately needed. There's tremendous need on all sides um, of this issue. Um, Representative uh, Wood has a question and I'm gonna have to change computers. I just got up. So <laughs> I'll be back, but Representative Wood will take over. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Sonia, you were just making me think when, um, I don't know why it just popped into my head, but um, do you have any data um, with regard to the BIPOC population in terms of their access to your, um, your tuition assistance and education programs? Yes, we actually, I have to uh, let you know that the, the most of the scholarships that we are giving out are through the TEACH program. And that program is very specifically um, targeted toward diversity and equity within the system. Um, that is actually a requirement that we keep data on all of that. And it is a requirement that that be a focus and target for us um, within that program. Not, you know, not just for the BIPOC population, but to, um, you know, financial equity, to um, other socioeconomic pieces, to regional, to programmatic and settings. Um, so there are several equity uh, lens, which we look through and keep data on. Thank you. Anybody else have any final questions? Um, and Johnny, just uh, thank you and my best to your dad. I worked with him. Um, so that was the first question I had, I have to say that did pop into my head uh, when, I, when I saw your name on our agenda. So um, thank you both for being here. Um, any, any final questions? Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. And we are now going to, um, I think that what Madam Chair has uh, asked us to do is to, um, one, you will see that the final version of the budget memo um, has been populated and sent to you. Uh, and I think is up on our website. Um, the other thing that we're going to do um, this afternoon is to, sorry about that a little bleep, um, is to now start, I guess, some discussion, really. We have more witnesses coming next week on this bill. Um, and as um, we talked about previously, our goal is to have a bill out of our committee by the end of next week, a week from today. Seems rather daunting when we think about it, right, at this particular moment. Um, but we haven't really had any discussion as a, as a full committee about the various uh, sort of about the overarching thing, but then about each individual component and section within the bill. Um, and it, is that what you were planning for now, Madam Chair? Um, well, now that I'm back on, uh, um, I was actually going to give people like a five minute stand up and turn around and look at their email where um, uh, Katie has sent us um, the another yeah. draft, which hopefully does that so that we can um, um, take a look at that and thumbs up or thumb, you know. Yes, on. I mentioned that, yes. Oh, okay. Um, it took me a long time to get on. All right, why don't okay. we take a, uh, um, it's two o'clock by my clock. Seriously, can we just, you know, be back by?